you're still here. <laughs> How many had a good fourth? A couple. <laughs> How many have experienced a little bit of God today? You know, it's good when uh, God has showed up and you've heard from, you know, prophetic words and then the flow of the Spirit. And and, uh, it's good that all that happens before the speaker gets up because the ground is already plowed and ready, you know. All right. Well, God is good. God is good. Yep. I have some stuff for you today. Let's just pray. I have a million uh, thoughts going on in my mind. Uh, I've been praying this morning, and, and God has just been opening up his word in my heart. So I want to make sure that I can ar- articulate it correctly. So, Father, I just pray that you'd come. I pray that my thoughts would be your thoughts and you'd give me the right words to say. And, Lord, I pray that you would open up Revelation today. Lord, I pray that you'd open up a new day, a new understanding of your glory and your presence. I pray that because we hear your word today, that we're going to live at a higher level and impact the world and actually change the world for Jesus Christ. I pray that that effect would come from the release of the word that you give today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Did you know that we don't serve a dead God? We don't. And God is in the process right now in our time frame You know, there were different moves of God. There was the early church, and they had a great outpouring of the Spirit, and they went from winning souls to multiplication. They uh, they were meeting in homes all over the place. They had cell groups everywhere, and the Spirit of God was manifesting in, in a tremendous wave of love, a tremendous way of His presence, His power, His presence, His power, and His goodness. Say goodness. Goodness. Last week we talked a little bit about His goodness. And I'd like you to go to Exodus 33, 18 through 23. And I I want to finish my thoughts. So there there were a number of moves of God that started with the early church. And again, we want fresh oil. We We don't want old oil. We want to be in sync with what God is releasing today. I remember praying at a youth camp years ago when I was a young man on fire, and I was trying to get people filled with the Holy Spirit, and God was bringing salvation that night, and it didn't flow very well. So finally, I stepped back and I said, God, how come I'm not experiencing your power and these young people aren't getting filled with the Spirit? And he said, I'm working on salvation tonight. So when we're in sync with the Holy Spirit, things come easy. And there is a movement today that is not the same movement that was yesterday. And when we get in sync with the Holy Spirit, things come easy. Does that make sense? There were healing revivals back in the 40s and all that, that healing came easy, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people were getting saved. You guys remember that? How many lived in the 40s? Amen. A few hands. Okay, praise God. Do you remember some of those moves? Yeah, William Branham. Uh, Oral Roberts, uh, I don't know, there was just a whole bunch of different people, but they would pack out tents, it would pack out uh, things. The TV stations were battling for uh, airtime with those early moves. Isn't that something? Because the American public were feeding off of what God was doing in that moment. And the problem is, just like manna, remember God released manna in the wilderness? And that manna was for that day. And when they tried to eat the manna that was the manna from yesterday, it didn't feed them. It actually made them sick. So we want to be in sync with what God, with what He has for today. Say today. Today. That's right. And I believe that we're coming into a whole different movement. You started seeing this a few years ago. People like 
Hillsong began to break into different levels of worship, and it was the glory and God's presence. And then Bethel came on the scene, and, and wild, crazy things were happening because they stepped into the revelation that God had for today. It wasn't yesterday's manna. It's what God was doing today. And they had wild manifestations. I think it was 23 times during high praise and worship when people were crying and calling out to Jesus that an actual glory cloud appeared 23 different times. One time it came out of the floor, another time it came out of the ceiling. Sometimes it burst out in front of them. Even the BBC uh, caught their attention and they wanted to find out what was going on. This is wild, but it isn't wild when you're in sync with what God is doing for that day. Amen? You can't make that happen. You can't make it happen again. It's when you come in sync today with what God is doing today. All right. So let's go to Exodus 33, 18 through 23. Are you guys alive? <laughs> we'll see what happens. Moses said this. This is a legal prayer. And if you just want to be religious and you don't want to really get to know God or experience the power and the, the fire of God, don't pray this prayer because it really changed Moses' life. He said this, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my what goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Even his name is wrapped up in his goodness. You can't know him unless you go through his goodness. And I will be gracious to whom I am gracious, and I will show mercy upon who I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Shandai. So Moses has this encounter with God. Remember the burning bush? He has an encounter with the glory of God. And then Moses began, he became a carrier of the glory. Say glory. glory. Sometimes it's interesting when the U.S. markets back in around the 90s, they began to work with China, or China began to work with the U.S. And China wanted to begin to make products, but they didn't have good quality, but they had very, very low uh, prices, labor rates. It was a communist country. We never wanted to do business with communist countries because it would alter our economy. It was unfair trade, right? But during a certain era... Um, that began to give way anyways, and they began to open that door. The problem was their prices were good, but their quality was terrible. So America began to send a vast amount of engineers and quality managers to go and teach China how to produce genuine uh, uh, good uh, products and they exposed them to new levels of thinking in quality, and they got rid of things in their minds, uh, statements like, that's good enough. As long as we sell it, that's good enough. And they actually began to transform the way that they viewed products and viewed customers. And they began to develop products at a very, very high level until their products were as good as our products. Why? Because our engineers went there and exposed them to a higher level of technology and quality until their level became our level or greater. We trained our competitors. Sometimes we can live in an environment in the things of the Spirit that we don't understand that there are higher levels until we have exposure to someone or to a revelation of God that comes in and opens our understanding, and we say, wow, I had no idea we could be at these kind of levels. Selah. 
And God is opening up a thing called the glory of God. How many have ever experienced the true glory of God? Amen. We've had moves through uh, history where God comes and reveals himself. And in those moments, they are undeniable. They are uncomparable to anything on the planet. I want to, I want to show you an example of what happens when the glory comes. Are you ready? This is kind of a fun one. You guys there? You're prophetic, so you should know where I'm at, right? Ready? Ready? Are you? First Samuel 5. Let's go to there. The glory of God. First Samuel 5. That's in the Old Testament. Just go down. Not to Second Samuel, First Samuel. I don't have time to read this whole thing. First Samuel. I have tabs on my Bible now. That's so nice. I gave away my Bible. And God gave me a better one. This, I was in Argentina and I was praying for people and just the glory of God was in that room. People started manifesting. We had all kinds of healings and wonderful things. And the Lord would tell me sometimes in those, in those meetings, he'd say, just stand in front of the person and see what I do. See, we're given gifts of the Spirit and one of the gifts, it says the working of miracles. And we learn how to work miracles. We learn how to move in faith. We learn how to prophesy. We learn how to do those things. And it's the working of those gifts. But when the glory of God comes and is manifested, it's no longer you working a, a miracle or you prophesying or you trying to do something. It's not through faith and it's not through anointing. When the glory comes, it's God saying, step back, it's my turn. And that's what's coming on to the church. We need gifts. We need anointings. We need to learn how to move in faith. But God is opening up again upon this planet, this thing called the glory. And it's undeniable, and people don't know what to do with it. And the, when the glory comes, when the glory comes, and you're carrying the glory, and you go into a place where there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus... <laughs> the glory always demands a decision. The glory always demands a decision. You can just be prayed up, you can, the glory of God is on you, and you can walk into a place and people start repenting because the glory demands a decision. All of a sudden they see themselves sinful and away from God and they're like, oh my goodness, what happened to me? And as you pass by, and you pay for your goods in the store and leave, that glory begins to fade. But they remember that severe feeling of conviction, and their life is marked. The glory always demands a decision. How many know that we need the glory of God back in the church? When the church is filled with a sin complex, when the church is filled with an atmosphere of living in the trenches it's because there is no longer an atmosphere of the glory when you come in contact with the glory you always want to go higher and better amen, amen. Yeah. you're thinking why would i do that when i can have this so people say well you need to preach on sin more when we do that's good but what we need is we need god in the house when god is in the house there's no room for living with you know, you can fill in the blank. All right, let's go here. Are you guys alive? Amen. First Samuel 5. Are you guys okay? Should we just talk about something else? Oh, I love this stuff. The Lord's been speaking to me so much about, I don't know. I don't have time to go there, but there are levels that we need to have exposure to so we can begin to move in higher levels. That's why it's important we bring in uh, people like Bobby Connor. We bring in different people that expose sides of God that we haven't seen before. It creates a, a higher expectation. It puts a stronger demand on the things of God. You guys alive? All right. Are we there in 1 Samuel yet? 1 Samuel 5? Did anybody read it yet? No? We're not going to read the whole thing, but this is such a fun, fun story this is a picture of what God is doing in the world today. And you can circle this, outline it, mark it up with someone's lipstick. I don't care. 
1 Samuel verse, or chapter 5, it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God, they stole the ark. I hate when that happens. I don't want anybody to steal the ark from my life or from our church. You know, it can happen. It's called a religious spirit. Amen. We give up the presence for acceptance and for the praise of the people. And as the ark goes down the road and you're waving goodbye, you have to come up with all kinds of crazy things to try to keep people stimulated and happy when the real reason why people come to church is they just want to know God. Amen. Selah. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from, what? Ebenezer. That's a real name. To Eshad. When the Philistines took the ark of God, now listen to this. This is what happens when you're full of the glory and you go back to work, okay? Listen to this now. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. They take the ark, the most holy place, the ark, the meeting place of God, the place that was the symbol of the Kabod or Shekinah glory of God. That means the intense, weighty presence of God. It was the epicenter of where God dwelt in a box. Why did he choose that? I don't know. But he did. And it was, he was put in this thing called the mercy seat. Say mercy seat. But it was the raw presence of Almighty God. And they were scared to death of this thing. And they thought if they took it from Israel, then they would no longer win in battles and so forth because they were stealing their power source. And they brought it in and they put it before their God uh, who was called uh, Dagon. No, this is, this is good. You guys okay? Look it. Now watch what happens. You put the presence of God in one of the most wicked, uh, this was a cultic environment, they did witchcraft. They did all kinds of crazy things. And they take the ark of God, the precious presence of God, Hebrew, the kabod of God, or the shekinah. Say shekinah. People use this term shekinah. Did you know that shekinah is not even in the Bible? You're like, well, all these ministries are called shekinah. <laughs> not in the Bible. No, it's not. It's Shekinah, and the Jews, they're always kind of afraid to use things too holy like God's name. So they took another uh, name that was very close to Shekinah, and they created their own term called Shekinah, which is fine. It's, it's good to use. It describes the heavy, weighty presence of Almighty God. But it's pronounced Shekinah. Say Shekinah. I want the Shekinah on my life. Amen. When Moses came from the mountain, he spent time in the glory, the Shekinah, and he came down to the people, and he, didn't, he wasn't aware of this. He knew that he encountered the glory, but he was not aware with, of what he carried. And when he came down off the mountain, the Shekinah was so brilliant on his life because when you're exposed to the things of God, you carry the things of God. You ever... You ever drive down the road and you hit a skunk that's not the shekinah but it you carry it for a long time you know what i mean but when you're exposed to the things of god you begin to acquire glory on your life and the glory can fade and the glory can increase and when you are in the presence of god and the glory increases wild things happen all the time how many can say amen? amen? This is just a picture of what happens when you have the glory of God in a very dark, cultic environment. Hey, that's what God's called us to do. Be full of the glory of God and to go into dark places. Wow. Hmm. Sounds like God. Okay, anyways. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon... Now, they put the ark in front of Dagon because they're going to teach God a lesson. Because their Dagon, they believed, was so powerful because of the witchcraft and all those things present at that time. 
They park the Ark of the Covenant in this temple right in front of Dagon, one of the most feared, fierce, uh, dangerous places in the world. And they simply put the Ark of God in the temple of Dagon. And God was shuddering. Oh, just kidding. He didn't even have to do anything. Here's what happens when any problem in the world is confronted with the glory and the presence of Almighty God. Here's what happens. You ready? And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Wouldn't you just kind of think, uh, I think we're losing. They put it up in place again. And when they arose early the next morning, where, let's see, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands, the palms of your hands are very, very important in the things of God. That's why the laying on of hands, they're, a, they're a, a point of distribution of power and authority. And when you take away the hands, you take away the authority. And when they arose early, here it is, Dagon, fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold, only Dagon's torso... <laughs> was left on it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor, this is so funny, nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the, on the uh, threshold of Dagon in Ashton to this day. But the hand of the Lord, now watch this, the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and the territory. I just want to give you a, a quick uh, rundown of what happens. God, just the simple presence, caused even this false idol to be smashed into pieces. Then the glory began to leak throughout the temple and into the whole community of Ashdod. And here's what happens when you don't accept the glory your life becomes very uncomfortable. It reveals everything dark and everything hidden and everything secret. And you break out, in a sense, in tumors. When the glory isn't present in a community or in a country, there's no conviction. But when the true glory of God comes, even Dagon himself falls and is smashed into pieces without even a word spoken. How many know we need the glory and presence of God back in our lives and in this community? Come on. They moved the Ark of the Covenant out of frustration because everywhere they put it, the same thing would happen. The glory would leak into the community and, and it would cause great terror to those that didn't want to find God. How many know that <laughs> the best witnessing tool is the presence of God. Amen. The glory always demands a decision. We can study all these evangelism concepts. Well, you know, if we convince them that they're dirty and evil, they'll come to Jesus. Or you can show up full of the presence of God, just stand there, and then they start crying and saying, Well, I don't know why I feel so dirty. It's the glory of God. We need to know the scripture, we need to know some techniques and all that, but we need to have the true glory of God. They finally put it on a cart to give it back to Israel, and we know that story. Um, they were going to bring it back, um, and then they finally ended up putting it in a house uh, of a very godly man uh, when they were going to bring it back to Israel, and they kept it there for some time because they really didn't know what to do. Because a man touched it, remember that whole thing? God struck him dead because even though God is good, he's still holy. Ooh, that's a word. And there they put the ark of God in the house of Obed-Edom. 
And everything that Obed-Edom did, God prospered when the glory is in the house. Why does God prosper, church? Because the glory is there. It always goes back to Jesus it always goes back to the glory of God. It's about God, and it's about Him, and it will always be about Him. And when we get so focused on ourselves and it's not on God, it is no longer a place of prosperity because the glory is left. You love me? Well, Jesus. I want to read just a couple of scriptures. Three things about the glory. The manifestation of glory comes in three different ways. It's, number one, it's the presence of God. We're going to get into that another time. It's the power of God, and America needs the true presence of God again, and they need the true power of God again. Would you agree? Yeah. It's, it, it, it so shocks me when I talk to people and I start sharing stories of God doing things and they look at me and they say, I never heard in my whole life that God even did anything. And I'm thinking, you're living in America, Bubba. <laughs> we need the presence of God back. We do. The presence of God, the power of God, and the goodness of God. We touched a little bit about the goodness of God. That's what happened to Obed-Edom is when the presence of God was in the house of Obed-Edom, everything prospered. I think his marriage was probably awesome. I think his finances were awesome. But everything in the house of Obed-Edom was blessed. He didn't change jobs. He didn't go back to school. He didn't do all those things. No, when the glory's in the house, the natural result of the glory is God's goodness overshadows you. Just try it out. Just try it out. Come on. All right, just a couple more things here. I'd like you to go to Romans 3.23. Here's a good one. I think all of us know this scripture. You guys alive? I like preaching things that God wants me to preach on because then I don't have to try very hard. Because on my own, it's no fun at all. Are you there yet? Romans 3. 23, how many study the Bible? Did you know that the Bible is supernatural? It was written by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God would come upon people, moved, and, it was, and he captured those things in this Bible. The Bible is supernatural, and if you're not feeling the presence of God, just read it for a while, because you're actually encountering the supernatural as you read it. I haven't heard from God for years. I haven't read the Bible for years either. Kind of goes together. Romans 3.23. Here's the, the beautiful scripture here about Jesus coming. Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned. Say sinned. That means that you have sinned. Did you sin? We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this scripture is talking about, if I can open this up in just a few minutes, it's talking about when Adam and Eve sinned, they lived in the kabod of God, or in the Shekinah glory of God. God gave them assignments, there was things for them to do, but their life was surrounded by the glory of God. It was just part of the package. What an awesome thing. Do you think they treated each other with kindness? I think so. That's what happens when you're around the glory. You become more like God. How many have been in the presence of God, then you do something stupid? What happens? Do you repent quickly or do you try to cover it? You repent quickly. So they weren't robots, but they were without sin and they were in the glory. And the Bible talks about how, you know, Eve, you know, those women, you know, they, they had to, you know, they like apples. I'm kidding. So... Some say it was Adam's fault, some say it was Eve. What I believe, it was their fault. How's that? They sinned, and when they sinned, they, for the first time in their life, hid from God. See, when the glory was still there, 
when the glory is there and you're not in a good place with God, you always hide, you isolate. Why aren't you in church? Uh, yeah. What kind of answer is that? <laughs> See, when we sin, when we're, let me, let me put it this way, when we're in a state that's not so good with God, we like to hide and isolate. So we know that they get driven out of the garden. God puts a fiery sword or something there and says, okay, you can't go back in. That's a bummer for mankind because from that day on, even through the time of Moses when he built the tabernacle and God said, I'm going to give you a pattern so you can encounter the glory of God from afar. They could see it, they could see the things of God, but they no longer could walk in the glory. In fact, if you went into the Holy of Holies, you'd die instantly. That's a bad day. One priest, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, could, couldn't have anything in his life unclean. He had to be spotless and pure. He had to wash. He had to wear new garments. Uh, everything had to be perfect, 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 perfect. He would take the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. And if everything was done just right, God would atone the people for another year. And the high priest would enjoy that very Shekinah glory of God for a few moments. And all the world desired that. Here's what happened. Are you with me? Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's the beautiful thing, that Jesus died for you, and through His blood, He became the great high priest and went before God and atoned for you, not for today, but for the rest of your life. And in the Bible, it says this, Now you can boldly enter into the throne room of grace to obtain favor and help in time of need. He's saying, when you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, you have the right to not only just hear about the glory of God, but to live in the glory of God. I want the manifest presence on my life. How many want the manifest presence on your life? How many want the manifest presence on your life? Well, I didn't know I could have that kind of presence. What do you think happened to the early church? They went up into the upper room. They were praying. They were seeking God. It said when they were all in one accord, all in one Honda. It said the. Just support me in my third grade humor. In the Old Testament, Moses was given a pattern where the glory would come. In the Old Testament, there was a gate. Jesus said, I am the gate. Say the gate. And the gate was filled with different colors, and they're all symbolic of Jesus Christ himself as the Savior. He was the gate. And you enter the gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. And there it is, the, the brazen altar that symbolized the cross. Say the cross. You see, you can't enter the glory today without the cross. Jesus died for you so you can encounter God. Blood had to be given. Death, life at the cross. Then you go to the lavern and the high priest would go and wash himself. Another picture of Jesus cleansing you. And then you enter into the holy place. There it is. I don't know if you can see it. You know, it's right over there. The table of showbread, that's the place of healing, that's the place of communion with God, that's the scripture. And then you walk over here and there's the candle albrum, that's the glory or the, the Holy Spirit. There's 66 symbols on the candle albrum, how many books in the Bible? This candle albrum was symbolized of the Holy Spirit and it required oil to be filled in every day so it would burn brightly. How often do you get filled? Then they go over to the altar of incense. There it is. It's burning. That is, symbolizes the prayers of the saints and your prayer life. And then you go into the Holy of Holies, and that's where the Kabod and the glory is. You couldn't enter that before, but now you can only through the blood of Jesus. When you try to enter in any other way, the Bible calls that a thief and a uh, robber, and you can only go through the sheep gate, and that is through the life and the death of Jesus Christ. We can enter into the glory. Anybody alive? Is this boring? Here's a beautiful thing. 
They finished that tabernacle and nothing happened. Woo, what a prayer meeting. Glory to God. You ever go to something and then you're like, huh, yeah, the races had more Holy Ghost than this. <laughs> nothing. So God says to Moses, he said, you have to sanctify the temple. So he goes back and he sanctifies the temple with blood and they, everything's set. And then they began to worship and everything. And guess what happened? The fire of God came down. It lit the fire and God lit the fire, but it was up to the priest to maintain the fire. So once you build according to his plan and it's sanctified according to his plan, the fire will come at that point, but now you need to maintain the fire. The day of Pentecost, you had the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You guys alive? Yes. I want you to see the pattern and the path to glory. The blood sacrifice came. Jesus Christ offered his own blood before the Father. He said he went into the place of the Holy Holies before the mercy seat, and he offered his blood, and, and God himself, the Father, said, <laughs> It is good. It is acceptable. The blood of Jesus is the perfect sacrifice to sanctify those who come to Him. Amen? So you have the sanctification of the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the sanctification of the temple through the blood of Jesus. If you accept Jesus as your Savior, you have the blood on your life. And, Jesus, and the Father looks through the blood and says, He's accepted. Not just accepted, He is beyond accepted. He's seen as the same, at the same level of purity as Jesus Christ. Means when we understand that we do not walk in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of God, it becomes very easy to walk in the glory. Yeah. But when condemnation and, and and uh, when you're always looking at yourself is never enough. You're actually inhibiting the very glory that God's trying to put upon you. Oh, this is boring. All right, picture this, picture this. I know we need to go. People are wanting hot dogs and brats and fried chicken. And, and uh, you know, and the rest of the holy ones here are like, no, keep preaching, Pastor. <laughs> Point to your neighbor and say, just hold on. Here's the beauty of the glory of God. You ready? Here's what happened on the day of Pentecost. We have the blood sacrifice. Now the temple is ready for the glory, but there's no glory yet. And I'm going to show you in just five minutes the work of the cross. This is so powerful. This is your key to access the very glory, the kabod that Moses walked in. I've been in the glory where my room became bright with God's glory, I hid my face and I shook on the floor for probably 10 minutes. I was so terrified in a good way, but I shook in the fear of God. I, I finally got up from the floor and I was trembling at a level I've never trembled before under the presence of God. I left that meeting, I went out, and I began to minister to people. And that was the time that We've seen uh, metal disappear and crazy miracles began to happen. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with the, the true kabod and presence of God on just a person's life. You see, we can work miracles. We can have an anointing to do miracles. We can have all these things. But when the glory's present, God says, step back, let me do it. It's a much different place. You guys okay? Here's Jesus Christ. I need to wrap this up. He, he dies, we see him offer his blood, he's trying to purify the temple just like in the pattern with Moses, there it is, God says it's sanctified, it's good, the Father says it's good, it's beyond good, it's perfect, there it is, Jesus arises, arise, uh, he raises from the dead, he says go, I'm going to send, I'm going to bring the promise of the Father. Jesus could only be in one place at one time because he was encapsulated in humanity, in human skin. He ascends. Now the Father releases the Holy Spirit. But he can't release the Holy Spirit, the kabod of God, the manifest presence of God, until there's a sanctified being, a sanctified temple. Again, the blood was good. Now we're ready. They go up in the upper room. They're, they're praying. They're waiting on God. And all of a sudden, 
God the Father looks down and says, My temple is sanctified. It's time for me to light the fire in my people. And what happened? A rushing mighty wind came, remember? And fire fell upon each of them. What is that symbolizing? He's just talking about the Old Testament. When the glory of God fell on the temple and <laughs> all of Israel seen the marks of God's glory. When we have the marks of God's glory on our life again, you won't need a lot of evangelism skills. You just need to get full of God and go somewhere. Amen? Amen. I wish I had time. I had written out a number of revivals through the years um, where even people like Charles Finney, he went after the things of God. And he spent time with God, and God began to open up the things of the glory. And all Charles Finney would do, there's many uh, stories of him walking in factories, and people would begin to start crying and falling on their knees saying, Brother, get me saved! And he would turn and he'd look at them, and just a look from Charles Finney would bring him to another level of repentance. And they begin to cry out to Jesus, and they would get saved. There was many, many times where people and communities would walk under the glory. When in the Welch Revival, I think it was in the Welch Revival, when the wave of glory began to break out in that church, it only takes a person. A person starts another person on fire. Pretty soon you have a whole church on fire. When the glory of God hit that church, it began to be spread throughout that whole region. And God himself would begin to hover around that region. And hard, hard, hard alcoholics and bitter cruel people would find themselves in the corner of their barns, repenting for no reason, curled up in a ball, shaking under the glory of God, saying, Oh God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. How many know that we need the glory in the house of God? All right, that's probably enough. We'll, we'll continue this some other time. Is this okay? How many know that we need the glory? I was going to read another scripture, but I just don't have time. But Jesus Christ said this. He said, Lord, the glory that you gave to me, I ask that you give to them. The glory that you gave to me, I ask that you give to them. As I and the Father are one, Lord, I ask that they would become one with us. Let's stand up. I hope I stretched you a little bit like an engineer in China. Hopefully I accomplished that. Just this, there's more. more. Let's try that again. There's more. more. I want to go back to our first scripture. (laughs) Amen. Glory. The first scripture I read was Moses, and he says to God, this is a legal prayer, Lord, show me your glory. I'd like you to close your eyes where you're at. I'd like you to close your eyes and with all your heart let's do this just like the temple if there are things in your life or maybe you've never known Jesus Christ as your Savior if there are things that are not so good in the temple let's give those to God right now because we don't want anything to war against the glory lust hatred resentment anger pornography, whatever it is. Satan will use that to work against. On the inside of you, you'll be in turmoil, and you won't be able to live in a place of peace to let the glory abide. So I ask now that you would ask God to forgive you and say, God, I need you to forgive me. I ask that you would release this from my life that I could walk in peace that I could know your glory just take a moment he'll let you carry things in your life as long as you want or you can get rid of it today he's really powerful enough to kill addictions I prayed for many people with addictions through the years and in one prayer they were completely set free wasn't me it was the glory of God there it is I just see someone else it's like an inner battle and in fact I see I see the word pornography 
and it, it, it's kicked your tail for a long time, and you said, I'm so frustrated, I'm ready to just quit everything. Well, remember the story of Dagon. What you need is the glory of God in your life. That pornography will fall at the face of Jesus Christ. So say this, say, I'm ready to die to pornography in your mind. Just say it, I'm ready to die. And Lord, I ask that you would come in your glory and kill this thing in my life. Perversions and anger. Other things that cause inner turmoil. God, we, we give these things to you today. We don't want anything to take place of the glory. All right. Now we're going to do a very powerful prayer. I'd like you to put your hands out like this. Whether you feel worthy or don't feel worthy, no. We just ask God to forgive you so all of you are worthy. Amen? Amen. He decided that on the cross. Say, Lord, Lord. show me your glory. Fill me with your glory. Let me carry your glory in the workplace, in the community, in the stores. Radiate, radiate from me, Lord. Let me carry your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I want to do something really scary, and then we're going to close. We're almost at noon, and, you know, if you're in church at noon, we all melt. You ever see the Wizard of Oz kind of like that? You know when the glory comes, nobody cares about time. It's important that we honor people's schedules, but time becomes less important when we're in the glory. I want you to put your hand on somebody. And I want you to pray for them for just a moment. I want people to have the opportunity to encounter God's glory and God's best. Let's just go ahead and pray for them. Just go ahead and pray for them. Go ahead. You use your own words. But God, I pray that you would destroy religion. Destroy a false concept of following God. Destroy a false concept of of Christianity. Let us see again the mighty hand of God with signs and wonders and miracles, the pure love of God, healthy families, gifts of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, God. Fill your people with your glory. You said the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. We thank you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Woo! Watch out, Dagon. Right? That guy that you work with that is always on your case and making your life terrible, all you need to do is show up with the glory. Boom! His arms will break off. (laughs) What happened to Joe? glory how many can say praise the Lord praise the Lord Lord. come on one more time praise the Lord Lord. amen God bless you have an awesome day and uh, just go change the world okay Amen. amen and eat a brat God bless you if you need prayer we're gonna have our worship or our ministry team up here God bless you amen